Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another review. Today we're going to be taking a look at Shadows of Mordor on PC. Shadows of Mordor is a PC game available on Steam, retailing for about $50 at the time of the review. It's fairly graphically intensive, so make sure your computer can handle the requirements before you finally make your purchase. For those familiar with the Assassin's Creed titles, you're going to feel right at home, as this game is basically a Lord of the Rings skin applied over top of an Assassin's Creed game. The combat system used in Shadows of Mordor is becoming much, much more common, with your primary sword attack being mostly spammed, and a counter button that you should hit when an enemy is about to strike you that will prevent all damage taken and instantly jump your character into engaging that enemy and protecting yourself. You have another button that does like a roll, vault over enemies, climbs stuff, sprints, and basically does anything that might suit any of your mobility needs. For anybody unfamiliar with the Assassin's Creed series, the climbing and movement is incredibly smooth in these games. You're gonna run into almost no problems as you traverse through the world. Now the general story and feel for the game, without going into any major spoilers, is that you're a ranger named Talion, who is linked to a ghostly elf from the past. Not his past, just the past. You learn more about your ghosty elf friend as the game goes on, and the story is heavily linked to the Lord of the Rings books, movies, and ring story. Talion and the elf guy are working together to remove the major powers from Mordor. The overall game lasts for about a 10 hour playthrough with plenty more time invested if you want to go and explore every nook and cranny and maximize your skills and upgrades in every way possible. You unlock power by traversing through the game and beating down orc and uruk captains that slowly give you access to combat perks like more instant kills and faster bow shots, etc, etc. Power is displayed with a red currency in the game. The other portion of your abilities is going to come from runes and general stat upgrades you buy with a white currency you get from another set of basic missions. This white currency can also unlock weapon rune slots. The way to obtain runes is to kill leaders and then they will drop a random rune. These runes have various small bonuses, but in all honesty they suck about 95% of the time. You're very quickly going to be getting repeats of almost the exact same runes, and they're going to fill up your inventory. I believe at one point in time, I had about 8 of the exact same rune give me a 30% chance to do something or other on a kill. The rune system is not all that interesting, as you get a lot of duplicates that really don't have any major changes or effects. What you end up doing is kind of hoping to get an epic rune, and then trying to just wait out for a drop that's actually going to impact your character. Now the primary game is broken into two parts, so don't worry when you're playing through and you feel like you've approached the ending pretty early. You basically hit a reset button halfway through the game and you begin battling an entirely new list of enemies. The most interesting unique feature is how you hunt through the ranks of Uruks. There are three standard tiers of strength for them, and then there's a fourth top tier, also known as the War Chiefs, which is going to be your quest target for about 98% of the game. You can mark targets, hunt down specific Uruks, and learn their strengths and weaknesses through interrogation. Overall, the game is well made, well put together, and it plays fairly smooth. There's a reason it's received raving reviews across the internet. But now, onto the real question. What do I personally think about some of the individual aspects of the game and how it plays? I'm gonna warn you now, you're just here for rainbows and sunshine, we're gonna strap on our criticism hat and it's gonna be a bit of a rocky ride. Okay, so when I played through the game, I used an Xbox controller, so I'm gonna reference those buttons as we talk. One of the first things you're going to experience combat-wise is sword combat, and right away, it feels like a ton of fun. You're just smashing X and he's flying all around and stabbing everybody in the face, and it's really just this phenomenal feeling. For me though, what felt like a huge drawback to the sword combat in the game is how insanely repetitive it gets extremely quickly. At one point in time I was talking to a coworker while working on the review, and I didn't even need to look at the screen. I ended up just kind of watching for the prompts for when to hit Y, and that's all I really needed to do other than smashing X over and over to destroy every single orc on the battlefield. Now later in the game it gets a little bit more interesting, but it ended up just being more frustrating than interesting with the new enemy combat types. The shield guys require you to stun them first, or you can flip over them and then stab them in the back. All I ended up really doing by the end of the game is instead of just spamming XXXXY, XXXXY to kind of go from stabbing and countering, I ended up just using a lot of counters and hitting X three or four times and then just doing executes over and over and over. That's the most efficient way to really work through the game, and I've seen a lot of people kind of posting that once they got further into the game it got really boring. Now when it comes to the bow combat, I found that part really fun. Basically, when you pull out your bow, you're going to have a matrix meter that just kind of slowly drains until time resumes and goes at a normal speed. While the matrix meter is active, you can kind of wind up your bow. Once it's fully powered, you let go. If you hit them in the head, you get an instant kill on almost everybody, except for the special, like, captain level orcs. And that part was actually really fun. By the end of the game, I was able to slaughter about half of any given army just with my bow, so I think it was a little bit overpowered. And it was really frustrating when you ran into the captains that were immune to ranged, because you've spent all this time powering up your bow, and then it's utterly useless against probably 80% of the important enemies near the end of the game. But the bow combat was actually just a significantly fun portion of the game for me. I really liked aiming and shooting everything in the face. The animations when you get a kill with the bow are fantastic as well. You can see them grimacing and like reeling back in slow motion, and making that like orc like ah face as they're kind of just really impacting from that shot, and you really feel it. 
Alright, so one of the main mission types I mentioned earlier in the review is the red missions, which are basically the orc captains are doing something. Either they're dueling each other, or one of them is about to get ambushed. There's always some event going on. And it's really, really cool when you first get into it. The events are really interesting and dynamic. The only problem is that you end up doing these red missions so many times throughout the duration of the game that they just get really, really repetitive. There's only like five or maybe six variations, and you're just going to see them over and over and over, and you quickly stop caring about these two orcs having a duel. There's a whole little world of story, and if lore is really what you're interested in, you're probably going to love this game, because if you really take your time, it's extremely cool to watch all these different characters interact with one another. And they made sure to be especially detailed with how these characters interact. So when you first get up to a special enemy, one of the first things you're going to recognize is that they're going to throw out a taunt. Like, hey ranger, nice to see you back from the grave. And that's really cool the first time you hear it, and it goes on and on and on, and they all have different comments based on how they've interacted with you in the past. The only downside to this, again, is the repetition. Because the game doesn't actually have a whole girth of content to deliver, they basically built a small game and then stretched it out over a 10 hour period of time. Now the small game they built is really, really great, but it only really has about a one hour of solid chunk of content. So what ends up happening is you hear the same taunts over and over, and you have all these characters taunting you in the same way. And often you'll run into a battle with maybe three, four, or five captains. And when you have that many orcs, what ends up happening is they all taunt you one at a time. So you're just trying to stab someone in the face and everyone's like, Hey, Ranger. And then they say, stop the camera. And then it pauses again. Hey, Ranger. And they all get their chance to kind of give you their own personalized taunt. It's cool, but it was overdone a little bit too much. Now, there's a few different variations of enemies, but in all honesty, they pretty much come out to be ranged orc or melee orc. And then there's three kinds of melee orc. Standard melee orc, melee orc with a shield, or melee orc that can't be hit unless you stun them first. So the enemies are pretty standard. There's a few small ones that you're going to run into very rarely, like there's the dogs, which are wargs, and there's also these little ghoulish guys that swarm you, and they're kind of neat, but all in all, there's not a lot of diversity in the enemies in the game. When you think of another game like Adventure Style, maybe say God of War, there's a lot of different unique enemy types. Shadows of Mordor actually limits it to maybe you're going to run into about four or five for the most part, and in all honesty, it's not really that interesting or unique, and you get kind of bored of fighting the same thing and smashing the same attack. You learn all their strategies really quickly, and then you don't really need to change up too much to keep bashing them all down. Okay, so one thing I want to say that's just phenomenally well done in this game is the animations and the graphics. They are amazing. As you, like, do an execution on an orc and you're slicing their head off, it feels so cool. Like, they're just tearing them apart. One of the drawbacks to the animations in the game, though, is that the team clearly loved their work, and wanted to make sure that you got to experience it to its fullest degree. And what I mean by this is they slow the game down like every five seconds for something. Every time you're swinging, they slow the game down. Every time someone's about to hit you, they slow the game down. Every time there's an animation, they slow the game down. So you end up in this like pseudo matrix mode. It's not quite as slow as the faux matrix mode, but you end up in this really drawn back slow version of the game all the time. One of the things they really missed the mark on, in my opinion, in this game were the boss battles. I don't think I've ever really spoken to somebody who's a gigantic, huge fan of quick time events, and they really, really laid into those pretty heavily. Because the sword combat was completely built around slaughtering 40 orcs at a time over and over and over throughout the game, they really didn't have a lot left to use in the boss battles. So instead of being unique, they basically just gave you an extra button and they're like, alright, hit this to hurt boss. So you generally need to do something to weaken the boss first, have him slam into a wall if he's a big monster, or sneak up on him or something, but then you kind of just hit one button and the fight's pretty much over. Again, no spoilers on this one, but the last boss battle is literally a quick time event where you hit about three buttons, and to me that was an extremely disappointing end to a pretty fun game. So in the beginning you get introduced to this orc army, and you're supposed to work your way through it and eliminate these different orcs and kind of take down their army from the inside and watch as it collapses. But what ends up happening is it just gets reinforced over and over. And often it gets reinforced by enemies with the same name and skill set and appearance as the guy you just killed. There's one point in the game where I literally stabbed a guy to death, and then he popped up like three seconds later and taunted me again. Hey Ranger! Over and over and over, and it got really really frustrating because it didn't feel like I had the impact on the world that I should have been having. So they built this really cool system, but for me at least, it didn't really work. It was cool and it was really interesting, but I didn't really feel like I needed to interact with that to get through the game, and that's kind of an unfortunate point for me. 
Now one really big part of the game that definitely needs to be mentioned in this review is how the strengths and weaknesses work for the war chiefs and their captain. Basically, every orc leader has strengths and weaknesses. You could figure them out by interrogating other lower level orcs, and they would tell you things about their masters. Once you knew these strengths and weaknesses, you can employ them to basically gain an advantage against these guys in battle. For example, if somebody was weak to stealth attacks, you couldn't usually one-shot an orc leader with a stealth attack, but ones who were weak to it, you could. Now, the strengths and weaknesses were definitely mandatory because they added enough of a challenge that it kept the game fun. What they didn't do very well is some of the strengths were absolutely ludicrously overpowered. For example, by the end of the game, I can't say I ran into a single orc leader that didn't have immune to range, which was a little bit frustrating because I spent all these points on my bow, and then it basically became rendered entirely useless at the end of the game. The other strength that was absolutely ludicrously overpowered was Combat Master. It basically stops all of your executions, all of your melee combat strings, all of your stun attacks, pretty much everything can't be done to someone with Combat Master. So when you ran into an enemy that had Combat Master and immunity to range, there was almost nothing you could do to actually harm them. Plus, as I fought through the enemies, they seemed to just randomly regenerate back to full health. So it was really aggravating trying to actually down some of these tougher orcs because they just didn't have any weaknesses to exploit. Or often these characters would be given the weakness to stealth attacks, but then every mission that they were included in would have them stand right in the middle cluster of like 8 or 10 other orcs, making it completely impossible to stealth attack them. So I think the strengths and weaknesses were a really cool concept, but I think they went just a little bit too far with some of the characters, making them just a tad bit frustrating to fight. Instead of the strengths and weaknesses adding depth and making it more fun and interesting to fight these, it just kind of took away all of your options and abilities, which was not overly enjoyable. So all in all, I will say I came away from the game with a positive experience, but with a lot of gripes and concerns that I hope I can see them polish up in a sequel. Now I will say honestly, I'm not the biggest fan of Assassin's Creed. Running around the city was a ton of fun, but I found the game got way too repetitive and extremely simple. I didn't like being able to go fight 40 or 50 guards at a time. I think it would be a lot more interesting if they took these games and made smaller skirmishes a lot more challenging. I don't like being able to counter every single hit that the orcs do, and I didn't like how the orcs just kind of stand around stumbling around like a bad kung fu movie while they wait for one guy to run in and fight you at a time. If I'm going to be surrounded and swarmed, I should feel surrounded and swarmed. Instead I felt more like a god, just surrounded by a big cluster of orcs I'm about to hack through without any problems at all. So don't take the criticism too heavily, the game was fantastic, it was really great, there was only a few bugs and errors I ran into, at one point in time the world turned into a bit of a rainbow, but other than that, nothing overly game-breaking. It was a bunch of fun, I did enjoy playing through it, but I just had a lot of things I kept complaining about, and it kind of drew away from my enjoyment of the game. So I don't generally do a point value at the end of my reviews, normally I talk about more of a buy versus not buy concept. I think Shadows of Mordor is definitely a buy for most people, but I will warn you that if you aren't a fan of the Assassin's Creed series, or you found that the combat was too boring or the game was too repetitive, then this is probably not a game you're going to enjoy too much. Again, my name is Matt, aka Skiar Rathbun, I'm here with GOM TV bringing you a review of Shadows of Mordor. Thank you very much for watching. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and follow me at Matt Skiar on Twitter. Thanks, you guys. Catch you next time.